The piece that, um, that that Leilani was just referencing, Sophie, about where she weighs in on what Will and Kate are like behind closed doors, is a, it's a masterclass in manipulation. It really is. Look how she sets herself up while just innocently commenting on how Will and Kate are behind closed doors. Watch this, 24. Even when Will and Kate came over and I had met her for the first time, they came over for dinner. I remember I was in ripped jeans and I was barefoot. It's like I was a hugger. I've always been a hugger. I didn't realize that that is really jarring for a lot of Brits. I guess I'd started to understand very quickly that the formality on the outside carried through on the inside. That there is a forward-facing way of being. And then you close the door and you go, oh, great. Okay, we can relax now. But that formality carries over on both sides. And that was surprising to me. Hmm. Sophie? Well, this woman is just a master manipulator. It's the entire reason that they left the royal family in the first place. They constantly banged on about saying, we want privacy, we want privacy. Well, I don't think a six-part Netflix series is privacy, nor is an Oprah interview. What she really wanted was control because she is a manipulator. She wanted to be able to manipulate people. She couldn't manipulate the press in the UK. That's why she was angry. She couldn't force people to write the stories that she wanted them to write. So therefore, she left to get privacy so that she could write the stories in her own perspective. This entire documentary has stemmed from a hatred and a jealousy of Kate. That is the reason this entire thing exists and the entire problems with the royal family and Harry and Meghan exist. She cannot stand Kate because Kate is beautiful, she is elegant, and she is going to be queen, and she is the centre of attention, and Meghan will never be the centre of attention. And they speak about, in this documentary, about the formality. Well, no, you know, no surprise, it's the royal family. And there's a hierarchy in this family. Well, again, no surprise, it's the royal family. And she, she perpetuates this narrative for the entire documentary of, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. Well, whose fault is that? Yours. Because this is the royal family. It's not some irrelevant family sitting in Alaska. Like, everybody knows what the royal family do. They know how it no works. No one believes that. No, no one believes that stupid claim that she didn't know what she was getting herself into. I've played this. Piers Morgan came on my show after the Oprah interview and we talked about this. But I, I queued it up for you gals. Now we have video. I don't show my kids on TV because unlike these two, I actually don't want to exploit them. Um, but I'll, I'll show you this video. My daughter Yardley, her face has got a gray square over it so you can't see her. But you can hear her and you can see her gestures. And this is my daughter Yardley. This is like a few weeks before I went over to cover the royal wedding. And I was just explaining to her, mom's going to be away for a week. I'm going to cover this royal wedding. And she had heard about it in school and she understands the basics. And she had just turned seven. I think she was either six, or late six or early seven in this video. Everyone understood what Meghan Markle was getting herself into. And here is the proof. Sot 21. Why would someone want to live in a royal family? They boss you around. It's like you go to a whole <laughs> different country and they have to boss you around. Like, you have to eat with your, le with your left hand. You have no choice. You have to. And I don't think that's fair. Because they've planned out your whole life for you. Right. And you already have your life perfectly in New York City. <laughs> that's true. And then you go to England, and surprisingly, you don't like your life because someone else makes your choices. And it's not fair. <laughs> I totally agree with you. I love what you said, Yards. Thanks. <laughs> Adorable. Thanks even a six-year-old could see it coming. Well, this is the thing. I think, you know, even a child could see, and I think Megan can see. But then again, we see that Megan has this obsession with Disney princesses. You know, we're always hearing about her um, talking about, you know, the, the Disney the Disney girl that got her voice back, Ariel, right? And then she wants to be compared to Diana, which is diametrically opposite because Diana didn't use her voice. Diana used her ears. Diana listened and listened. And that's what people loved about her. But Meghan had this Disney idea of what a princess is and thinking it's all going to be, you know, red carpet events and like a Kardashian reality show and the best designer clothes. And what she maybe didn't realize that it was going to be duty and she would have to go to parts of the country that she might not like, that weren't glamorous, cut a tape, 
speak to people, but listen to what these people had to say about their lives. Listen to what they were going through about the work that they were in, not being lectured about net zero and green energy by Meghan Markle. You know, Meghan would have to listen. So maybe that bit she didn't realize she would have to do. But as far as curtsying to um, the Queen, come on, I mean... She was supposed to have done a, a, a degree in international relations or international studies. You know, you curtsy to the queen, you bow when you're in Japan. There's certain things in certain countries that are marks of respect. And if you have done studies in international relations, then you know, she should know that. And and she oh, and as if Harry wouldn't have said, here's right. how it's done. Like he, 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 he may not curtsy. I don't know what he does to the queen, but I'm sure he's seen a curtsy 10,000 times. But I think that you ladies are underestimating the sacrifice this poor woman made during her stint over in your country. I give you, for example, the fashion. Look what this poor girl had to go through, SOT 28. Most of the time that I was in the UK, I rarely wore color. <laughs> <laughs> There was <gasps> thought in that, to my understanding. You can't ever wear the same color as Her Majesty if there's a group event. But then you also shouldn't be wearing the same color as one of the other more senior members of the family. So I was like, well, what's a color that they'll probably never wear? Camel, beige, white. So I wore a lot of muted tones, but it also was so I could just blend in. Like, I'm not trying to stand out here. There's no version of me joining this family and trying to not do everything I could to fit in. I don't want to embarrass the family. I can't. Like the, the beige. Sophie, come on. That was wrong. This this entire documentary, I'm sorry, it's just so pathetic. I mean, we have one of the most privileged people in the entire world. I mean, people in my country, we are literally like our homes are freezing. We, you know, we're choosing between heating and eating. There's a war in Ukraine. And here we have the Duchess of Montecito crying about how hard her life is because she had to wear beige. <laughs> <laughs> Duchess that happened. Not oppressed. She's not a victim. It's just nonsense. It's absolutely. But I think what you said a second ago, Sophie, is is interesting. I heard. I saw somebody online say, I think it was tongue in cheek, but they said anybody who's had a borderline personality disorder friend in their life understand what's ha what's happening from Meghan Markle's perspective toward Kate. Like she does seem to be very focused on her. To take any shots at Will and Kate in this documentary is pretty extraordinary. I mean, Harry used to be like their third wheel and they were very good to him. She's, she's been very kind to him. Why would they be taking shots at Will and Kate? You know, they're not responsible for this massive institution, not yet. Um, so she does seem to be obsessed with her because she raised her again in the Oprah interview in a way that we were told was dishonest. She, to your point a moment ago, that's interesting to me that you think this whole thing is, is about her anger toward the Princess of Wales. 100%. It's just pure jealousy against Kate. This in, this entire Netflix deal, the entire reason she came out of the royal family is because she just cannot deal with the fact that there is another woman who is equally as beautiful, who is a whole lot more classy and a whole lot more talented and just better fit for the royal family than she is. And she cannot handle that. And that's this is all coming out of jealousy and of rage. And Harry's just sitting there and watching like a loser. That's the thing, Harry. By the way, I mean Leilani on the on the wardrobe front, uh, Meghan wore tons of color while she was over there in the UK and yeah. part of the royal family. We we have plenty of evidence of it. Uh, and she, by the way, because my have crack producers, she wore tons of camel and black and white prior to joining the royal family and after. So I don't know what like this is just so classic her. You know, look look at the sacrifices I tried. I tried so hard to fit in, but those mean stiff royals were feeding me to the slaughter. But, you know, muted colors are also in fashion at the times. You know, a camel coat, you're out in the countryside, you'd wear something muted. I mean, it's all poor me. And this is the whole thing. It has been years and years of poor me, poor me, all about her, you know. And, and then what she wants to do is blame it on racism and blame, you know, the palace, royalty, um, then the media, and then actually the British people, which you see happening in episode two, when she starts to try and say Britain's racist because of rows over illegal immigrants, not, not legal immigrants, illegal immigrants. And it paints this picture 
for England, you know, and, and Britain being racist. But when we go back to it, the reason people don't like her is because she has been all about me, 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 me. And she thinks that she can relate to people. Maybe she thinks, oh, it makes me more relatable if I have problems that I can complain about because right now there is this whole thing of competitive victimhood that's going on points for um points for racism points for um uh, I'm being put on points for being bullied so it's all to me I think it's a, so much of it's made up but she can play on these like victim points compete with other you know not real victims of like abuse or anything but she plays the victim and so for me, the turning point was when she was in South Africa and she was doing a tour. She was at a home with um, very vulnerable girls. And it was an ITV uh, journalist that said to her, you know, Megan, um, how are you doing? She's like, no one ever asks if I'm OK. And it's like, whoa, for so me, that was like, hold on a minute. You have not only money, but you also have a healthy child. I think it was one at the time and a husband that loves you dearly right, um, and a mother that loves you, and you're you're playing this poor me, I'm a victim, with real, you know, vulnerable people around you that you're supposed to be on tour with. And I think that was a turning point for a lot of people when it became me, 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 oh, poor me, but then she'll blame it on racism. And it's the, it's the weirdest, craziest thing. Oliver the Ornament is a seven-book series about one family's collection of ornaments. The first book begins Thanksgiving night, while the last book takes place on Christmas morning. Each book introduces a new holiday ornament and weaves in the story of that ornament. It's a good idea, right? Super cute for the whole family. The books teach kindness, and they have lots of plot twists and cliffhangers. This is a great tradition for your entire family. Parents, grandparents, kids, grandkids, they're all going to look forward to the next family story night. It's a nice way to get everybody together. Maybe some hot cocoa mixed in, maybe a warm fire. Maybe some eggnog for the grown-ups. It's great for the holiday season. Oliver the Ornament has won all kinds of awards and accolades. First Lady Melania Trump selected this book to be read at Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C., continuing a 75-year-long tradition. Go to olivertheornament.com today. Olivertheornament.com today. Hit the big Shop Now button on the page, and when you buy the Oliver the Ornament set, you're going to get a whole bunch of extra goodies, including audiobooks. Use the code MEGAN at checkout, Oliver the Ornament, O R N A M E N T dot com. Use code MEGAN at checkout. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.